Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are around the world. My name is Sarah Borgman, and I am part of the Skoll Foundation team, and I'm so excited to welcome you to the Skoll World Forum session titled Investing in Innovation, Year of the Health and Healthcare Worker. For those just joining us, the forum's theme this year is Closing the Distance. This specific session brings together senior ministry officials whose governments have prioritized their health workforce with innovative and creative models. And we have an exciting group of speakers to enrich and grow our perspectives. I just wanna share a few quick items before we begin. This session is being recorded and will be released publicly after the event. Please feel free to use the chat to engage with each other and ask questions of the speakers. After the session, please take a few seconds to complete the survey in the poll tab to the right of the hop-in video screen. On social media, we are using the hashtag SkullWF, and we would love for you to share, love for you to do the same. Now I'd like to extend a special thank you to the Clinton Health Access Initiative for proposing and designing this session. With that, I'd like to introduce Yogan Pillay, the country director of South Africa and Senior Global Director for Universal Health Coverage from the Clinton Health Initiative to kick us off. Go ahead, Yogi. Sarah, thank you very much. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. And thank you all very much for joining us and welcome to today's panel. And as Sarah said, the topic for today is investing in innovation during the World Health Organization's year of the health and care worker. As Sarah said, I'm with the Clinton Health Access Initiative based in South Africa, and previously the Deputy Director General for Health in the National Department of Health. We bring to you a very exciting mix of both government leaders and health systems and investors to talk about how we can support health and care workers where they are needed most. I can tell you just this morning in South Africa, in one of the provinces, uh, together with our partner at the Alma Foundation, Chai has invested in refurbishing a maternity unit, which we handed over to both the minister, uh, national minister and the provincial MEC for health. And I can tell you how very positive both the obstetricians, the midwives, and the rest of the staff in that maternity unit were. It was very clear that infrastructure, equipment, and happy and productive health workers are really what we need to achieve universal health coverage. Now the COVID-19 pandemic has brought a renewed spotlight on the plight of health workers, the, challenge, the challenges they face and the need to invest in the underlying systems that train and support them to do their jobs the best they can. The pandemic has exacerbating pre-existing shortages of health workers and the systems to support, manage and train them. In 2016, the World Health Organization estimated that there is a global shortage of some 18 million health workers, which is expected to grow in many resource constrained regions by 2030. The gap is most acute as we know in Africa, which bears 24% of the global burden of disease, yet has only 4% of the world's health workforce. In the face of these challenges, people around the world have been thinking about celebrating championing, and championing the cause of health and care workers, while the WHO has formally declared 2021 the year of the health and care worker. Now is our chance to hear from government and investors on how we can turn this attention to action. The global community has warned about the health risks that health workers faced during the 2014 and 2015 Ebola epidemic. And we will hear some of these lessons today from Dr. Bernice Don, the Vice President of Health Sciences at the University of Liberia and the former Minister of Health during the 2014-2015 Ebola epidemic. Many sub-Saharan governments responded to the COVID pandemic swiftly and at scale. And we are excited to hear about major health workforce interventions from the panelists today. While the world responds to the immediate crisis, governments are simultaneously continuing to plan for the future. And we are looking forward to hearing lessons from long-term health workforce programs from Dr. Patrick Indi Mubanzi, the Executive Secretary of Rwanda, responsible for human resources and uh, the Health Secretariat, and the former Minister of State in charge of primary health care. 
catalytic upstream investments can make a huge impact on a health system, ability to respond to crises. And we will hear about the importance of these systems for delivering primary health care from the Honorable Minister of Health from the Federal Republic of Ethiopia, Dr. Lear. Many investors have already heeded the call and are working closely with governments on long-term challenges faced by their health systems. We will hear about why health workforce should be a focus area for funders from the executive director of the Elma Foundation, Robin Calder Harawi. While COVID captures the world's focus, we cannot forget that diseases do not slow down in the absence of our attention. And we will hear about investing in workforce innovations as a cross-cutting platform for tackling today's challenges from Dr. Mona Amami, Senior Director of the Crown Prince Court of Abu Dhabi. Looking forward, we will hear about how COVID has proven how we can drive innovation forward while building a solid foundation from Tracy McNeil, the Director of Health Systems at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Last but not least, we want to hear from you, the audience, on your questions and reactions to topics raised by our panelists. Please share your questions in the chat box and we will facilitate a discussion amongst the panelists in response. Thank you again for joining us today. So without further ado, we will start with Dr. Dong. Dr. Dong, during the Ebola epidemic, the government suspended all activities besides emergency responses and health workforce planning. Can you please describe to this audience why this was a priority during a time of crisis and what lessons Liberia brought to combating the, the, the current COVID con, uh, pandemic? And have these lessons worked during our current COVID pandemic? Dr. Don, over to you. Okay, thank you and good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody, depending on where you are. During a public health crisis, or an epidemic, especially epidemics that are fatal, interrupting the transmission to save lives is a necessary priority. During the Ebola epidemic in Liberia, routine health care services collapse. And it is possible that more persons died from the root from diseases that normally could have been managed or prevented, even though we don't have the hard data for that. But if we look at the World Bank and other projected major spikes in maternal mortality, for example, it became very necessary that uh, routine health services was just as essential as the outbreak to save lives. So while fighting uh, Ebola, the health workforce was our top priority because the human resources are the engine for the healthcare delivery system. Without the workforce, nothing can happen. And we already had so few compared to our actual needs. Many of our health workers also died during the Ebola outbreak, making our workforce shortage even more acute. So by the end of the Ebola epidemic, the ministry had produced an investment plan for building a resilient healthcare delivery system. And that plan had nine pillars and it prioritized three. And one of the three was a fit for purpose health workforce. It is difficult to prioritize when the needs are many. However, it is necessary, especially if you seek donors support or support from others to prioritize among the priorities. 
So it is important for the ministry to have a very discreet number of clear government priorities to advocate for from donors. Equally so, it is necessary that donors align their resources to the government priorities by being very specific that provides the opportunity for donors to help the government the way the government wants the donor to help them. So after designing the investment plan, we also created a very detailed strategy for the health workforce pillar. It was like a 100 page uh, document. And even though we had this detailed document with everything outlined, it was still difficult to get direct funding from the government's own activities. But it did help us to align major resources from the World Bank, USAID, Global Fund, and others. A point I would like to come back to later is the need for the donors and technical partners to take a longer term healthcare system strengthening view. Even though many were interested in helping immediately post Ebola, the attention to building the health systems did not last long. Many started changing a year or two after the Ebola crisis. It takes several years to build the health workforce. But if you take time to invest in the foundation, you can build any structure on top of that foundation and you can innovate on that foundation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Don. I, I don't think I can re-emphasize any more than you have the importance of health system strengthening. What was clear from the Ebola epidemic, as is clear from the current pandemic, is that unless you have a strong health workforce and a strong health system, you will not be able to cope with any crisis. So thank you very much, Dr. Don. I'd like to turn now to Dr. Patrick. Dr. Patrick, how has Rwanda's response to the pandemic been bolstered by investments in health workers over the past 10 years? What do you think other governments and investors in the audience can learn from the successes of Rwanda's health uh, workforce program? What were the pitfalls that Rwanda encountered that others should avoid? Over to you, Dr. Patrick. Thank you, Dr. Jürgen. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone, wherever you are in the world. Dr. Dan and Tracy, it's good to meet you again here. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank the organizers for giving us the opportunity to contribute to this important conversation. And I'm happy to share some of the experiences uh, from Rwanda and learn from other countries. As you all know, health workers are the backbone of any system any health system, they are essential to the people-centered approach that we all promote so often because sufficient, well-trained, motivated staff are the cornerstone to providing quality, timely, life-saving healthcare services. Over the years, Rwanda has implemented various uh, initiatives in health workforce development at different levels of the health pyramid. In 1995, the community health program was established, and now we have close to 60,000 community health workers across the country. And we have three to four community health workers in each and every village, and they are involved in health promotion, prevention activities, and also some curative care, but mainly, uh, and in many instances, they, they serve as the first responders. The, the Rwanda Human Resource for Health program that runs from 2012 to 2019 established 12 new programs 
and strengthened several programs that were already existing. The program achieved many successes, actually. And during the course of the seven years, uh, the, one, the University of Rwanda graduated more than 4,000 new cadres who have been instrumental in the COVID-19 response. These cadres include medical specialists, such as anesthesiologists, emergency medicine physicians, general practitioners, specialized nurses, such as ICU nurses, uh, midwife, dental surgeons, who work in our health centers, districts, hospitals, and before hospitals. The HRH program contributed significantly to increase the health professional density in the country, which has been very helpful during the response to the pandemic. As a result, the uptake of services and patient outcome improved remarkably. Uh, and if I give some few numbers, in 2010, the childhood vaccination stood at 80%. The recent demographic health survey that we undertake, we, we've undertaken in last year showed that the childhood vaccination stands at 96% now for 12 different antigens. The uptake of modern contraceptive methods by married women uh, more than doubled over the last 10 years from 27% to 58%. And the end of five mortality dropped by 41% in 10 years, whereas the maternal mortality dropped by 43% in the same period. The 1990-90 goals for HIV treatment targets were achieved ahead of time already in 2018. But almost as importantly, the outcome of the HRH program, among other factors, contributed to building uh, the public trust and confidence in the health system. This is critically important when managing a pandemic, where there's trust, people seek care early, comply easily with public health measures, have no stigma, and a quick example is the extremely low level of vaccine hesitancy in Rwanda. The public trust is not built during a, a pandemic, but before. So the, uh, I, I would say that the HRH has been a great foundation for the current health professional development strategy that we started implementing since last year. And it helped mitigate somehow the increased burden of health workers uh, face during uh, the public health emergency. And if I were to answer to your question, Jürgen, about what's the pitfall that we should avoid, is to think that you can establish a, a head force development in just seven years. That's too short. We definitely need at least a cycle of 10 years and another cycle of 10 years, so that not only you train the health providers that you need in the system, but that you also develop them into educators who will sustain the health education. Thank you very much. Dr. Patrick, thank you. Thank you so very much. Um, I think you've reinforced also Dr. Don's comment about this being a long-term project and it can't be a one or two year project. Uh, I, I think your emphasis on public trust, uh, which has led to these significant improvements in uh, health outcomes, I think are the envy of the rest of us in Africa. I can say that for sure from South Africa. So thank you very much for the hard work you and your colleagues are doing in Rwanda. Thank you. Uh, I want to move now to the Honorable Minister, Dr. Lea. Dr. Lea, as we've heard, government response to emergencies is impacted by long-term investment in preparation of health workers. You have been an advocate for pre-service training for many years now, both as a minister and in your previous work. Many funders shy away from investments in pre-service training because they view these activities as significantly upstream from service provision and are wary of the timelines to impact. How do you think about quality of pre-service training and its relationship to quality of care? And can you please share with us what do you see as opportunities in this area? How does the form and content of pre-service training impact on the quality of care provided. Over to you, Honorable Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Yogan, for the opportunity. 
Yes, uh, indeed, uh, pre-service training and the investment in pre-service training is something I'm uh, personally passionate about and also a key area that the government of Ethiopia has been investing a lot on in the past maybe two decades or uh, more. And uh, yes, on a personal note, as you mentioned before, uh, my role as the minister as well, uh, I, I had the opportunity to lead uh, one of the largest teaching hospitals in Ethiopia, where uh, it was, a, of course, a new uh, teaching medical school at the time. And I was involved in uh, the uh, opening new programs in medicine, nursing, and specialty uh, residency programs, but not just in opening them, but in uh, creating partnerships to make sure that the training programs are competency-based and uh, uh, not on, also in terms of skills, but also to inculcate the necessary attitude that's needed to uh, provide a comprehensive quality of care. And uh, I, I definitely agree with what you said that many uh, donors definitely shy away of investing in pre-service training because it's a long-term commitment and maybe the fruits that we see require time, but it is the sustainable way of changing a health system to provide quality of care because the change that we would like to see in providing health, strong health care or quality of care, they require time to develop and it's usually difficult to achieve them with very short in-service trainings. Uh, because these uh, training programs uh, invest in changing attitude, in changing skills and competencies with the right, of course, investment, if right, the right investment is made in those programs. And Ethiopia has been expanding, I mean, investing a lot in overall uh, uh, to avail the needed health professionals in the country in all the skill mix, starting from the primary health care with our health extension program. Uh, uh, which is a, a, a one-year program for uh, those who, who are out of high school, but is also uh, has been refined throughout the years to make it uh, more competency-based and uh, up to the different uh, me medical schools that have been expanded in the past 10, 15 years and uh, a huge expansion and investment that's also ongoing in developing specialty uh, training programs because we need to have all the right skill mix at a, a different level uh, of, of healthcare and more so we have seen that uh, how, how much that is needed especially in this year of uh, pandemic where the different specialty in, in emergency and critical care has have been instrumental for the services we provide and those investments have uh, definitely paid off not only in delivering the care we need at the, at the critical care level but providing uh, uh, community-based care for those in based isolation uh, giving uh, uh, doing to ensure that the uh, to ensure that people get the needed care, not only for COVID, but also those who have sure that are, are also continuing to get the, the needed services and so that services are not disrupted and uh, patients are not suffering from those. Uh, so, uh, we, we have had a lot of uh, huge experiences in terms of th such progress to uh, uh, health professionals at the different tier level of the health service, but still the challenge has been as we expand, uh, it, we still need to expand our training and we still need a lot of more uh, health professionals, healthcare workers in the different skill mix. But as we expand, the ensuring the quality at all level has been one of the challenges and one of the areas that we are also trying to focus on working in partnership with different uh, uh, development partners, other universities in other countries uh, to ensure that um, those uh, training programs uh, have the needed expertise as faculty. They have the needed uh, infrastructure like simulation labs, skill labs that are needed for to develop the needed skills and also the right curriculum in place to ensure that uh, all the competencies are addressed in this time. And one of the key achievements I think we've had is to ensure that the, the curriculum that is given throughout the country is harmonized 
and uh, uh, all the uh, different experts in, in education have come together uh, with Minister of Health and Minister of Education to make sure that the, those curriculum that we deliver are not uh, different and are not uh, uh, and also they have the, the needed standards in place uh, while we dealt to, to while we are on the road to ensure this quality so our focus as we have been expanding a lot in terms of number of schools programs our focus now in the next five to ten years is heavily focuses on ensuring the right quality is in place so that we build the needed uh, quality of care for for the health system thank you so much Honorable Minister, thank you so very much. Uh, you know, the extension worker program in, in Ethiopia is really something we've all been aspiring to. Um, so thank you very much for your leadership. I think, you know, your emphasis on the right skills with the right attitudes in the right numbers in the right places is, is exactly what I think we would like to see evolving out of, out of this, this panel discussion. So thank you very much, Honorable Minister. I'd like to move now to Robin. Um, Robin, in addition to assisting countries with the immediate COVID response and specific disease areas, such as pediatric HIV, Elma has been a champion for making catalytic investments in governments and local partners to strengthen their health workforce. Can you tell us why health workforce is a priority area for the Elma Foundation and how you see other funders and partners in the audience being able to support governments? Robin, over to you. Hi, uh, Dr. Yogan, thank you so much. And it is such a pleasure to be able to share this Zoom space with the incredible champions from government that you've just heard from and Ramadan Kareem for those who are celebrating. I am Robin Calder Harawi, the executive director of the Elma Foundation. And the Elma Foundation is primarily focused on improving the lives of children in Africa. Um, and as we've heard from, from Dr. Yogan in the opening commentary, Sub-Saharan Africa bears over one third of the global burden of, of, of maternal, newborn and childhood disease and is home to two thirds of the world's HIV positive population, yet only has 4% of the world's health workforce. And as my uh, fellow panelists have already shared, if we really want to sustainably address, uh, eliminate diseases, um, improve maternal and newborn care, respond to COVID, prevent the next pandemic, we have to invest in the health workforce and developing the health workforce, strengthening the health workforce and the overall health system. So this is why ELMA has decided to, we built out a grant investing program that is called Build the Workforce for Children. And it's entirely focused on strengthening the health workforce working in partnership primarily with governments um, and implementing partners in Africa. Um, and so through this grant investing program, we invest in uh, four levels of strengthening the uh, referral systems and, and health workforce. The first is supporting governments uh, and ministries of health like the ministries of health in Liberia, Rwanda and Ethiopia that you've heard from today to support their national planning efforts to figure out who is currently in the health workforce? What positions are missing? How do we optimize the existing workforce? What are the training institutions needed? What do we have to do to, up, to upskill the capacity of those training institutions? How do we fundraise for this health workforce vision? We support a lot of that planning and coordination efforts of, of our uh, friends in the ministries of health. Then we invest in the community health uh, programs many of which you've heard described in Liberia, Rwanda, and Ethiopia. This is because up to 3 million maternal, newborn, and child uh, deaths could be prevented by interventions that a, that a trained, remunerated, and supported community health worker can deliver. So we've made large-scale investments in, in all of the community health systems that, that have been uh, discussed today. The second layer of the, the health workforce that, we, that ELMA invests in, in partnership with governments, is health workers that are critical that are for, for the to support healthy birth and the newborn period. Um, and, and this is because Elma is focused on children um, and, 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 but we really narrow in on this uh, newborn period. And this is because in spite of incredible progress, there are still 2.6 million newborn deaths every year. It's 45% of under five mortality happens in the first month of life. Um, and it's a story of global inequity. 
newborn deaths are the single biggest cause. So that's death in the first month of life. The single, the single biggest driver of mortality in low-income countries, it's not even in the top 10 causes of mortality in high-income countries. A baby that is born in Africa is 10 times more likely to die in the first month of life than a baby born in a high-income country. This is why we really focus in on this critical cadre of workers that need to be present at health facilities to support healthy pregnancy delivery um, and, and the newborn period. Additionally, this mortality, this newborn mortality, this tragedy of newborn mortality is highly preventable if you have a midwife and a nurse uh, available at the time of birth, they can deliver 80% of the essential care needed for mothers and newborns. So like uh, the Honorable Minister Dr. Leah shared, the, it's very important to invest not only in upskilling existing workforce, but also in the pre-service training. So in partnership with governments and in alignment with their national plans for the health workforce, ELMA makes critical investments in the training institutions in many of these countries, the nursing schools, the medical schools. Um, we invest in developing faculty. We invest in simulation labs. We invest in skills labs, um, kind of building the capacity of these institutions to deliver competency and practice-based training for midwives, nurses, and other healthcare workers. And we'll also provide financing to support uh, an increase of output of, um, of, of, of trainees through those uh, training institutions um, in partnership with government who, who, who covers the, who provides the salaried positions in the public sector when they graduate. Um, and finally, the, the final area that, that ELMA invests in, in partnership with governments, is investing in the pediatricians and the subspecialists that are needed to, to drive innovation and to lead health systems um, in many of, uh, of the countries uh, in Africa. And uh, our flagship investment is in the African Pediatric Fellowship Program, um, which it was launched in 2008 in South Africa. It's now a partnership between three South African universities um, and hospitals, ministries of health, and ministries of health from 17 countries across Africa. And what happens in the program is basically governments will identify doctors in their country that they want to send to South Africa to get uh, additional training to become uh, pediatric subspecialists or advanced nurses. Um, and, and, and they train in South Africa and then they return to their countries to deliver care and to, and to run health systems, to run you know, national referral hospitals, to, to develop newborn care guidelines, um, et cetera. And to, to really drive some of the implementation of the national um, plans. And to date, this program has trained 200 specialists from across the continent. Um, as a result of the African Pediatric Fellowship Program, their uh, APFP, as we call it, has tripled the number of pediatricians in Malawi um, <clears throat> and produced the only, the first and only neonatologists in Uganda, Zambia, and Malawi, which is, which is just worth spending a moment to, to pause on. Um, uh, Malawi, Zambia, and Malawi together, sorry, Uganda, Zambia, and Malawi together, f it, there's a population of about 80 million people. That's double the size of California. And yet they each have only one neonatologist uh, working in the country. This is, this is absolutely unacceptable. Los Angeles alone has almost 500 neonatologists. This is exactly the kind of global inequity and the critical gaps that African Pediatric Fellowship Program seeks to, to fill. Um, we've recently launched, when I say we, the African Pediatric Fellowship Program has recently launched in Kenya. Uh, it's a partnership between five universities and their goal is to train 140 pediatric specialists by 2023. Um, if, we get, if we can crowd in more funding from other private funders, we can expand this program and develop hubs across the continent in Ethiopia in West Africa and elsewhere. Um, and I just wanna emphasize again that the, the specialists that are trained through APFP go on to run health systems, um, to, to, to develop guidelines, to innovate um, in the countries um, where, where working with ministries of health. Um, and that all of these levels of the health workforce that ELMA invests in is in partnership with government and in partnership with the Ministry of Health to ensure that we are aligned, that we are first contributing to the national plans, helping them get raise funding from official, you know, official uh, donors, 
and that we are helping to fill in critical gaps and catalyze funding into critical gaps at the community level, at the uh, nurse and midwife training level, and, and very importantly, at the specialist um, level. So uh, thank you, Dr. Yogan, and back over to you. Thanks, thanks very much, Robin. I, I've, having spoken to some of the fellows from your fellowship program, I can attest to how sincere they are about not only the training program, but how they think the training program can help them back in their home countries. Uh, the issue that you raise about neonates is, is rather a tragedy because you know in most countries, the major causes of neonatal mortality are asphyxia, prematurity, and sepsis, all of which are avoidable and treatable. So neonates should not be dying. So I think you know one of the commitments, I think we should all in our personal and collective uh, uh, ability be able to, to provide is a commitment to reducing neonatal mortality to less than the SDG target of 12 per thousand live births. You know, I think if that's something we can achieve together with reducing maternal mortality by really strengthening the health workforce, I think we would have done the continent a great service. So Robin, thank you very much uh, for your inputs. I want to turn now to Dr. Mona. Dr. Mona, the Crown Prince Court of Abu Dhabi has been a regular champion of neglected tropical diseases. While COVID has obviously captured the world's attention, what drives your interest in health workers as a platform to address both the visible and the neglect neglected problems of our time? What type of solutions would best meet the needs of countries with significant burdens from neglected tropical diseases. Dr. Mona, over to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Yogan. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. So, um, and I'm delighted to be sharing this with, with so many uh, familiar faces also. So from our side, um, I mean, part of our investments as Crown Prince Court has been under an umbrella called Reaching the Last Mile. And I think the name says quite a bit. Um, so we've been in, interested very much in disease elimination from neglected tropical diseases to malaria to polio, um, and particularly in reaching glass mile areas and achieving disease elimination. Uh, so we've been long-term investors in polio and guinea worm, uh, for instance. But neglected tropical diseases focus currently has been, to a large extent, uh, focused on mass drug administrations. It's a very cost-efficient uh, sort of intervention where you can definitely address things like schistosomiasis, um, lymphatic filariasis, oncocerciasis, um, and trachoma and others. But it doesn't necessarily apply to all sorts of neglected tropical diseases, especially the ones that do not require drugs, you know, for instance, guinea worms. But also NTDs um, have a lot of impact on long-term disabilities for many people suffering from them. They're definitely diseases of poverty. They're diseases of, of mostly neglected people. And for us, they're a reflection of development outcomes, lack of equity and access to healthcare systems. So in our interventions, not just on NTDs, but on malaria and polio, similarly, we've, we've become over time slightly more disease agnostic, interested in more cross-cutting thematic issues that are able to address these issues. I mean, NTDs themselves are 20 diseases, of which if you look at the new roadmap by the WHO, the solutions are really on less on these vertical interventions, but on these horizontal interventions. And a big part of that is of course the health workforce. Um, and in our case, because these are sort of diseases in very remote areas, community health workers become extremely important. Um, you know, if you look at uh, Guinea worm, where you're looking at 26, 27 cases remaining in the world, the role of community health workers becomes extremely essential. Um, and, and in addressing, not just in addressing, in finding these sort of remaining cases, but in also changing uh, mentalities of people, you know, because with guinea worm, we really don't have any drug, right? It's about prevention. Um, and so you need from within the system, a lot of support. So, so that's one part of our interest. But now we're also not just interested in community health workers as such. We're interested in bringing NTDs, mainstreaming it into routine health systems. Um, and that's extremely important for us, right? I mean, it, it's, it, you cannot look at this problem as just, a, you know, fund some of the community health workers and it will go away. Um, so that's a, a very important step for us. We're also interested in addressing health, the health workforce. In our case, for instance, in, in polio in Pakistan, the health workforce for us is extremely essential because of the, you know, the ability to vaccinate people has been a struggle, particularly in a place that's not very 
uh, from a security perspective has been troublesome. So a lot of the security around those community health workers and volunteers has been a priority for us, but also ensuring that those have some form of employment. So we actually employ 97,000 community health workers as part of our polio program in Pakistan, because that's the only solution for you to incentivize much of them. Um, so we're, we're interested in that space, but we're also interested in the sustainability of much of our investments. Um, I, I, so I discussed a bit the NTD's malaria polio uh, case, but similar to what Robin has been mentioning, we are very interested in when we withdraw as a, as a funder, have we created sustainable change in the places that we've, we've been? And as such, we're interested increasingly in training of nurses and doctors, particularly for subspecialties that um, do not exist. Uh, you know, maternal and neonatal are, are one example, but there's others that we're, we're also looking into. Um, and, and this usually from a funder's perspective, um, I think her Honorable Leah had mentioned this, is less interesting for many reasons. One on a per unit cost is actually quite expensive. Um, and so if you're thinking from typical donors, um, non-philanthropists, but government donors, and if you're justifying for a taxpayer uh, you know, perspective, it's, it's less likely for you to go into those types of interventions. But for us, we also are long-term investors. In our NTD space, we do 10-year investments, which is rare to do commitments that long. Um, and we see you know, ourselves as making investments in ending the job. So if we go into training of, of doctors and nurses, you're probably in it for the long term. That's rare to find. Um, I mean, Elma, I think, is really in that space. We like to co-fund a lot with Elma, and Robin knows that. But, but it's, we would love to see more uh, donors join in that, um, you know, eventually in that space. So this is, this is how we, we're looking into this. I think at the corner sort of all of this is really the health workforce. 36 out of the 57 countries that WHO looked at as in terms of shortages are in Sub-Saharan Africa. We can see a solution for disease elimination without looking at the health workforce and healthcare system strengthening. COVID is just one example of a reminder, but the underlying conditions are all across for so many of the remaining diseases. Thank you so much, Dr. Yogan. Dr. Mara, thanks you very much. I love your payoff line. Let's finish the job. Uh, so I think working collectively, uh, even though we know it's difficult and we need to be in for the long haul, uh, we can finish the job. So thank you very much. And thank you so much also for raising the issue of, you know, how do you transition from vertical programs into what's known as horizontal program, you know, in the health workforce case, for example, and how do you integrate and mainstream NTDs into the general health service delivery platform? I think those are very important things that we need to think about. And, you know, what training do these health workers who have been trained in a vertical program, what training, how do they need to be reskilled to fall into the mainstream of service delivery? I think those are key issues. Dr. Mona, thank you very much. Uh, our last speaker for the first round um, is, uh, is Tracy uh, from the Mil Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Tracy, can I ask, the Gates Foundation has been robustly supporting governments in their COVID response. Coming from the health system's perspective, where do you see the biggest challenges and opportunities for investors and implementers in this audience to support government in the immediate and long-term priorities? Over to you, Tracy. Thank, thank you very much. And thank you for that introduction. And uh, good afternoon, I'm, I'm in the UK. So good afternoon, um, honorable ministers, distinguished guests, fellow panelists. Um, and um, everybody who's joined the call, and that's great to see some fellow colleagues, in particular Dr. Patrick uh, from, from Rwanda. Um, so um, I'm delighted to be here representing the foundation. Um, it's probably important for me to say I've, I've uh, literally only been in the foundation a few months, so, uh, so bear that in mind um, in, in terms of um, the comments I'm going to make. So um, I think that um, COVID has given um, uh, uh, you know, we're in a pandemic, it's been a very difficult time and, and a tragic time for, for many families in many countries. Um, but, I, but I also think um, amongst those challenges, there is opportunity. So many of you will know that uh, my background has been uh, previously in new and emerging technology, um, digital healthcare, AI, and working very closely with the government of Rwanda. And I think when I look at the opportunities that COVID brings as um, I remember a couple of years ago, it was very difficult to talk about digital healthcare and how that could be integrated into health systems globally, particularly in LMICs. 
Um, and it took quite a lot of persuasion, um, a lot of working with governments, um, even in the developed world, to see that new and emerging technology had a role to play. And then we went into COVID. And then suddenly um, individuals, wherever they were in the world, felt uncomfortable about going into health centers, health posts. And so digital became at the forefront and suddenly everybody was looking at digitalization, digital options and different ways of working. So I think that um, how we see it in the, in the foundation, and as you know, that uh, the foundation has um, heavily invested in COVAX and work around um, COVID. And um, we see that there's a momentum that's been created that all of us have a responsibility um, to, uh, to make sure that new and emerging technology and new ways of working um, really stays. So I think if, if I turn specifically to the work of the health systems team that, that I lead, um, the, the work that we're doing at the moment, and we'll be engaging with many of you as external stakeholders and experts in this area, is that we're looking at our primary healthcare strategy, which the foundation um, hasn't had before. And that's because um, the co-chairs feel that uh, we should have a strategy in primary health care and we should be investing heavily in this area. And so um, on the, the opportunity we see for us is six building blocks, um, which are health financing data, supply chain, demand, facilities and service delivery and workforce. So today I'm just going to focus on the workforce um, part of that and where I see the challenges and opportunities. I think that, you know, the fellow panelists have explained um, uh, very clearly the shortage, particularly in Africa, of healthcare workers. I, I've been fortunate to, to see and, and work closely with governments in terms of how by using new technology and innovation, you can turn that same workforce um, into being um, more productive, more efficient, um, directing care at the patients that, that need it in different ways and making healthcare much more accessible to those, particularly in, in, rem, in remote areas. And all of that can happen on a, on a basic feature phone. And so I, I think some of the work that we'll be looking at within the foundation is, um, you know, how far can we go in terms of making um, digital first in terms of utilizing workforce? When I say digital first, I'm also talking about other aspects of the workforce. So, so not just putting individuals on a digital platform where they can actually perform remote consultations without um, individuals having to maybe travel five, ten kilometers to a health post. In some places, understandably, they may have to wait several hours. Um, they may even get turned away at the end of the day because, um, because some of those health posts and centres are really busy. So, um, you know, some of the things that we're looking at in addition to that is um, digital payments. So, you know, one of the issues that the foundation has invested in and has concerns about um, are around um, healthcare workers being paid. Um, and so uh, we've been doing some really interesting work around digital payments. So if um, healthcare workers are paid um, on time, they're paid frequently, they're paid for the work that they do, then there's some really interesting research coming out of that in terms of motivation of, of healthcare workers. Uh, I, for one, as a, as, a, as a healthcare worker, don't believe that individuals, healthcare workers don't turn up to work um, generally just because they don't want to. That's not why most individuals go into being healthcare providers. So I think if we can look at some of those problems we're trying to solve, which may be around um, digital payments, then um, I think that that will also help. I think some of the other areas that um, I'm really keen that the foundation looks at in workforce um, is around workforce planning, um, is um, around task sharing. I also think that governance is a key theme for us. So, um, when I when I draw back from the um, incredible experience I had in Rwanda working with the government there, it, it, it's really important that um, whatever systems you put in place are fully integrated um, with the public healthcare systems. Um, and so if you have a completely integrated model where the incentives are aligned with the government, you understand um, how they're tracking, how they're benchmarking, what their key challenges are and what the problems are they're trying to solve, 
And if you work in partnership with implementers, um, then I actually believe that, it, that, that then we can really have um, new innovative ways of working that become um, sustainable. And importantly for us in the foundation, uh, not just sustainable, but replicable. So how, how can we work with exemplars and then take the lessons and learning um, in terms of workforce and digitalization and actually turn those into um, global public goods by working with other um, large institutions? But I guess one of the final things I'll talk about at this point in terms of an opportunity um, in terms of workforce is around e-pharmacy and um, e-prescribing and e-referral. And certainly where you um, implement a, a digital integrated system um, and you can do that on a national basis by linking into pharmacists, then patients can access um, consultations on a digital platform they can have um, e-prescribing provided to them as a service by um, networking um, national pharmacists across the country. Those pharmacists have to link into the national um, pharmacy guidelines and formularies for, for those country programs that you're prescribing within an agreed list. By doing that, you're not only providing better access and quality of care to patients, but you're also helping other verticals um, within those six building blocks so it's helped supply chain management you know when there's stock outs and um, you know uh, um, when um, you know patients may have been refused to be given certain drugs by a, a pharmacist a whole range of different issues so I, I'm, I'm going to stop there but to summarize to say that um, for us in the foundation we're excited about health systems we're excited about the primary healthcare strategy and working with you workforce is a really significant pillar and we see that there's a real opportunity now um, on the back of COVID, not to do things that are just in incremental, is to be brave and be really innovative and really go that extra mile and let's together all make a difference. Casey, Thank thanks. Thanks so very much. Uh, I think, you know, the, the COVID uh, pandemic has accelerated digital health care um, in many countries. And I think, you know, we are, we have been able to show, and COVID has forced us really to show that we can leapfrog using digital solutions. And I like the examples you provided around e-pharmacy prescribing, uh, e-referrals, et cetera. So I think, you know, it, it, it might uh, it improve efficiency as well as productivity, as well as decreasing the, the burden on healthcare, healthcare workers and patients alike. So I think there's a, you know, there's a lot to be said for it as well as your focus as with the other panelists on strengthening the primary healthcare system. We are somewhat behind time. So in the next round, I'm gonna ask all of my dear panelists to be rather brief. And uh, because uh, the Honorable Minister Leah has to leave soon, I'm gonna ask her to go first. And again, to uh, emphasize that in order to give our audience time to ask and for us to respond to them, uh, I'm going to ask all panelists to be brief in the second round. Uh, Honorable Minister Leah, previously Ethiopia used a flooding strategy focused on rapidly increasing the number of healthcare workers, training as many healthcare workers as you have, including extension workers. Looking forward, what is Ethiopia's top HRH priority and how will this create a foundation for expanding universal health services? And are there any challenges that you anticipate as you move in this direction? Dr. Leah? Thank you, Dr. Yogan. Uh, as you rightly said, our biggest focus in terms of the next five to 10 years is achieving universal health coverage, which depends on not just, not just having enough healthcare providers, but also on the capacity to produce teams of high quality at uh, the different levels, both in mid, uh, mid uh, level providers, specialty level, and uh, primary care uh, providers. And uh, we have uh, designed uh, different plans to achieve that, of which just to mention the two. One is the medical specialist and mid level care providing uh, 10 year plan, training plan, and also a specialty and subspecialty roadmap. And the, the focus of these plans is to be able. Uh, to provide a framework of, for investment from both government and partners alike uh, through coordination and, al and alignment so that uh, all the 
training programs that we have in the different parts of the country will achieve uh, the standards we have set, the rigorous standards for the that we have set for the different training programs, because we have a, a huge variability among the different programs we have across the country, which at the end of the day uh, impacts the quality of uh, the, the uh, trainees or the graduates, and in the end, the quality of program. So to achieve that, uh, uh, these plans include several details of which the, just to mention core, the few core things. One is ensuring that uh, the, the faculty have the right skills. So this will be achieved, of course, through different uh, uh, partnerships that we envision with different institutions locally, because some of the uh, institutions have a long experience and some are, are very new, but also internationally with different academic institutions. And uh, the other is, uh, to of course get uh, not just uh, so this partnership will have will give an opportunity for faculty development where faculty can uh, get those experiences while in country but also can have some ex exposures in other uh, academic institutions but also have visiting faculty for that and this we have seen in few institutions has brought significant impact uh, such partnerships have really lasting sustainable impact in uh, developing the quality of pre-service training. And the other is, of course, the needed environment that needs to be there in those teaching institutions, uh, which I mentioned briefly earlier, like the needed skill labs, uh, of course, improving the quality of the service itself is a big uh, factor for the kind of training, the, the uh, uh, clinical skills training that our trainees has have. And I, to achieve uh, all this, uh, it's, of course, uh, critical to have the needed resources. So we also hope to uh, galvanize more resources and create more partnerships and uh, a call on more donors engagement to achieve uh, this uh, ambitious plan. Because as you have said, we have been uh, most focused on flooding initially, but now the biggest shift is into quality. So we do hope to get more support in that regard. Thank you so much. Thanks very much, Honorable Minister. Uh, and clearly, I mean, you articulate the need for the academic platform in our countries to be strengthened as we are strengthening the service delivery platforms. So thank you very much, Honorable Minister. Dr. Patrick, your secretariat recently launched its National Health Workforce Strategy. What are the main priorities that uh, the Rwandese government has set out? Dr. Patrick? Thank you, Jürgen. The 10-year national strategy for health professional development that was launched uh, last year is designed to strengthen health professional education and thereby increase the number of high quality professionals in the country. The strategy has four main areas of focus, education sustainability. We need to make sure that the specialists that we develop uh, become mentors and faculty so that the program is sustained. And for that to happen, we will need to train people locally, but sometimes for programs that we don't have in country, we will need to send people uh, abroad. And I loved what uh, Robin said earlier about the pediatric program. The second focus will be to improve the education environment. It requires infrastructure and equipment, but also good governance, because it's not only what's material, it's also the non-material, uh, how that's uh, managed is also important. Then just to echo what Minister Leah said, it's, qu it's quantity, but it's also quality. Uh, and we have a very strong focus on ethics, professionalism, soft skills of, such as communication, compassion, attitude, and so on. Lastly, uh, but not the least, we need to have a strong planning and monitoring system to adjust uh, as needed during the implementation uh, curse of this uh, of this tenure, so that when we complete the ten years, we have qualified, competent, and equitably distributed workforce. So here in this strategy, we're aiming to be implementing thirty-seven academic programs, including ten new subspecialties, and one of the specialties uh, is uh, neonatology, pediatrics, pediatric oncology, gynecology. Given the burden of the disease that we have. Uh, because it's not only infectious diseases, but also non-communicable diseases that are increasing. And so what Robin and what Mona said uh, uh, resonated with, with me a lot, uh, neonatology and pediatrics, because we have 
40% of our population that's below 15 years old, and uh, NTDs, NCDs as well. I also uh, heard what uh, Tracy said when she says we need to be bold and innovative, and we're looking at using more technology in teaching, but also in ensuring that students acquire the knowledge and technology, have things like electronic logbooks, or have classrooms that are run concurrently in Rwanda and in some of our partners' countries. So in conclusion, Rwanda is very committed to developing both the quality and the quantity of the health, the health workforce. This requires basically three main elements, availability of faculty, equipment, infrastructure investments in teaching, hospital and learning environments. And for this to happen, we are engaging and reaching out to all potential partners who will be interested, interested to work to work with us and produce a health workforce required to produce and provide uh, preventive, creative health care to all our citizens across our country and beyond. So you are all Thanks. invited to Rwanda to join in and we appreciate you, uh, all those who have already joined in and who will continue to partner with us. And for those who are still planning, please welcome and thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Dr. Patrick. And I think, you know, the soft skills you mentioned, including ethics, are really critical in the way in which we train our healthcare workers. Um, and now that we are all au fait with courtesy of unfortunately COVID, Zoom and Teams and WebEx, I think to the extent it's possible, some of this teaching and learning across the continent can now occur remotely. So we need to explore uh, with our partners, how we can maximize this opportunity as well. Thank you very much, Dr. Patrick. I want to move on to Dr. Don. Dr. Don, after your role as Minister of Health, you've been working as the Vice President of Health Sciences at the University of Liberia. What is your major focus for developing the health workforce and what are some of your challenges? Dr. Don? I would like to follow up on a point that Robin made, Robin from the uh, Elma Foundation. Prior to the Ebola outbreak in 2015, we had only two pediatricians in the country. One was well over 70, had reached retirement, and we were still holding on to her. We sent one of our young promising doctors to the Africa Pediatric Fellowship Program on a scholarship and she became a pediatrician and came back home. Currently, Dr. Sia Kamano is now providing clinical services. She's a faculty training pediatricians locally in a residency training program that we established. And she is also serving as the chief medical officer for the Republic of Liberia. So I think we should invest more and expand on regional and national training initiatives. Now, since I stepped down from the minister's position and took on the role as the head of the College of Health Sciences at our national university, I continue to, I think I can continue to make a difference in building a health workforce. We have a strategic vision for the college in two phases. The phase one is to strengthen the current programs by improving uh, quality, the quality of training by upgrading in new teaching methods and making smart technology decisions to maximize our limited faculty resources. So far, we have revised the medical school curriculum, changing from a five-year post-bachelor's degree to a seven-year post-high school program. The new curriculum moves away from didactic teaching to experiential team-based learning. We'll start implementing that curriculum by October, the next academic year. We have also transitioned our Bachelor of Pharmacy program to a Doctor of Pharmacy program. We are in the process of upgrading nursing and midwifery to a Bachelor's 
degree and build onto a master's program to increase the number of faculty for training programs. And then we are also strengthening our newly established public health school that was established in 2018 post Ebola. Our phase two of the strategy is to also look at establishing new programs in country, especially for cadres that we do not have at all, or we have in shortfalls. So that include dental workers, including oral health technicians. We want to, current USAID supported us with technical assistance and we have developed a medical laboratory training curriculum. And we are currently looking for resources to support the implementation of that. At the moment in country, 80% of the laboratory work is done by technicians and assistants. Only 20% are actually technologists. Um, we also plan to establish a school of biomedical and allied health sciences. So the main challenge we face in a resource limited setting is aligning external resources so that we have a comprehensive support for our plan. At present, we have sig significant support for programmatic activities like the curriculum design, faculty training programs that is coming from the US government and the World Bank. As part of a new five-year USAID project funding the college, we will be improving our grants management and administration systems, which will facilitate our internal management of more resources. This project will hopefully encourage others to invest directly in our training institutions. It is more difficult to get support for infrastructure that provides space for these programs to exist and to thrive. For example, the college has inadequate dormitories currently, and so the dormitories are overcrowded. One is even at the point of that we have been advised to demolish. So about some 300 students at the moment, we are looking for space. And also limited classrooms for, for students. We plan to establish a modern simulation lab. At the moment, we are procuring mannequins and equipment, but there's no space. So we are adjusting in offices and classrooms <laughs> to put these mannequins. As part of our strategic uh, vision, we have a campus master plan. Dr. And Dom, the World Bank, yes. I, I hate to interrupt you. We're running desperately short of time. Uh, can I ask you to make your final comment, please? Yes, the, the World Bank is uh, uh, supported, kick-started the master plan by building a few dormitories and two classrooms. We need additional investors to complete the master plan so that we have enough space for our teachers, for students, library, classroom, auditoriums, and the rest. Thank you. Dr. Don, thank you very much. It sounds, the university sounds like a very exciting place right now. I wish I could come and help, help you there as well. And so thank you very much. And I'm sure investors in the audience have heard very clearly what some of your challenges are in rebuilding and strengthening uh, your programs. I'm going to turn now to the three speakers that we will hear from before we go to the audience, and I'm going to ask them to be brief, uh, if, uh, as brief as possible. Robin, these uh, major national in in initiatives uh, that, you know, everybody, all of us need seem quite daunting when taken at, at face value. What advice do you have for partners and investors in the audience as they try to try to find where and you know where they can find a space for themselves linked and aligned to their own programming, and where they think they can make the most impact um, to achieve the national health workforce vision of uh, governments in sub-Saharan Africa. Robin, over to you. There we go. Um, Great, thank you so much. And I'm gonna be very, very brief uh, because I'd love to hear from, from others and from the audience. 
Um, so the, the first uh, advice I would have is to listen to uh, African leaders and experts. And as you've all heard today, the, the people that are running um, you know, ministries of health and running health systems and working in government, they know what their countries need. Um, they, they can identify the, the needs, they can identify the gaps. Um, many folks, in, including you, Dr. Yogan, when you were the deputy director general for in, uh, of health for the government of South Africa, you know how to work with private funders. Um, you can tell us what are your needs? How can we be helpful? What are the, 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 the gaps and the costs that flexible private funding, even though it may not be massive funding like what um, official aid can provide, you can advise us on you know, where are the gaps that, that, that private philanthropy can supportive to, to unlock bigger pools of funding or to be, um, to be catalytic. So, so that's my first piece of advice is just, you know, listen to, to the experts and hear what they're saying and, and, and partner together. Um, Chai can often serve as an intermediary on this um, to basically understand, you know, what are the needs and where, where can private philanthropy be helpful? The second thing I would say is let's combine our resources. So, you know, one private philanthropy, you know, trying to make an impact on the large scale needs that have been presented here today, it's hard to do it on our own. But when we pool our resources together, we, we have more, uh, you know, we're pooling not just our funding, but we're pooling our brain power and we can big, be a bigger force for change. And we've seen examples of this through co-impact and audacious projects support of the Community Health Assistance Program in Liberia, partnering with Last Mile Health. We've seen it through partnerships between the Crown Prince Court, ELMA, um, and the Gates Foundation to work on disease elimination across Africa. When we can work together and pool our resources, we can be even more useful to governments and towards these um, national plans. And we can help you know, fund the needs that have been presented here today, strengthening the, um, you know, the, the training institutions, um, investing in digital solutions, things like Project Echo that can help um, you know, expand remote uh, sharing and learning of in-service providers. And then finally, my biggest piece of uh, advice is invest in people. I mean, if we have learned anything through this pandemic, it's that health workers are essential. Um, and, and, and this can be a key area for private philanthropy to support, to, to really invest in the champions from the community health worker whose community is relying on her for healthcare, to the midwife who is understaffed in, in, in a maternity unit, to the pediatrician that Dr. Don uh, just spoke about, Dr. Sia, who's the chief medical officer in Liberia. These healthcare champions need our investment and our, and our partnerships. So, so let's listen to African leaders, let's combine our resources and let's invest in people. Thanks Robin, three great suggestions for fellow funders. Uh, moving on uh, to Dr. Mona. Dr. Mona, we, we know there are many problems in the health workforce space. What kinds of solutions are you most excited about? Dr. Mona? Thank you so much, Dr. Yogan. I think from our side, I mean, th th there's two challenges that I think at the core of this. One is on the community health workers side is how do you make them part of the system? So how do you integrate in the system? How do you create employment standards, clear roles and responsibilities, funding of payroll, uh, some form of association for indemnification? How do you formalize that side? And that I think is, is one issue. The second issue is how do you um, train uh, and upskill, you know, mid-level um, specialized workforce? So those are two areas of interest for us. What makes me super excited in terms of solutions, I'm trying to be as brief as possible, so I'm probably saying a thousand words in one second. <laughs> uh, but on the community health workers, we're very interested in two areas. One, and I emphasize our interest in that, particularly because we operate in rural areas where we really need uh, support from community health workers, but also we're cognizant of the fact that we're sometimes overlaying so much responsibility on community health workers that we forget that they're only part of the one solution. So you almost expect a community health worker to have a PhD in, in all, all sorts of stuff. So we, we're cognizant of that, but we still believe in their power. Two areas of interest for us is financing of community health workers and innovation and financing. Um, and the second one is you know, the power of innovation in tech and digitization and supporting. So, so issues around, uh, you know, telemedicine platforms that increases knowledge of diseases, but also allow for large case surveillance, um, ability to reach off the grid rural communities by integrating, for instance, things like solar energy 
into the same time mobile uh, penetration partnerships with entities like Facebook, which are really trying to to, to allow for, uh, you know, internet connectivity everywhere, because we realize that there's a lot of overlay over digitization of things, but, you know, this, the underlying developmental, um, uh, you know, issues are still there, right? Connectivity, internet access, and what have you remain issues. Um, on, on the financing side, we're very interested in innovative ways, particularly in things like use of um, fintech and, and crowdfunding on issues such as remittances to allow for community um, health investments, um, which actually have a 10 to 1 return on investment anyways. But we're also interested in things like Islamic finance, uh, retail sukuk, uh, crowdfunding, and those types of uh, care. Those, I think, are generally things that we think have an amazing future in terms of financing, not just of uh, you know, health workforce, but also of, of a lot of health-related uh, issues. Uh, on the training side on upskilling, I think we, we're interested in re not just, I mean, when, you, when I think of some of the programs that Robin has been discussing, um, through the African Fellowship Program, for instance, it's one thing to be able to train and increase the number of specialties. It's another to think of how do you retain them. Um, and then retention of the health workforce becomes very important, particularly because of this high, huge size of immigration that is in the, in the continent. So how do you create incentives to keep them? Um, I, I don't think that the incentives are only uh, uh, financial. I think to a larger part, you need to think about how you create a system to be able to allow uh, you know, there's a lot of other peers, there's a system that's around it, there's potential for you to improve your own skills and to grow. So those were maybe definitely areas of interest for us. Thank you so much. Thanks, Dr. Mona. You know, I'm particularly interested in picking up on your innovative financing ideas. And I think, you know, collectively, we should find some space uh, post this uh, panel discussion to think through what some of the innovative financing options might be for strengthening health in the health workforce. Thanks very much, Dr. Mona. And our final panelist for this round is uh, again, Tracy. Tracy, what advice would you offer governments and partners seeking to develop partnerships around major health system strengthening initiatives? Um, and you know, what would the foundation in particular be focusing on? And what advice do you have for all of us? Tracy, over, over to you. Thank you, Jürgen. Um, um, a, a very good question. And, and I think that um, some of the work we're embarking on, um, I, and I'm going to be um, very, very brief because um, the, we need to leave the rest of the time for our audience. But um, in terms of a public private partnership, that's going to be a core thread of the work that we're doing in developing our primary healthcare strategy. Um, as Robin said earlier, none of us can do this on our own. Um, I think it's really important that we understand the role of the public and the private sector, how we can bring those two groups of key stakeholders um, around the table to, great, to create greater impact. And I think, you know, some, when, I, when I look at some of my own experience that I've been really lucky to learn from was, um, you know, a good example from, from Rwanda, which Dr. Patrick will remember, is that when we were looking at demand and, and trying to grow the user, user base um, for um, those in the uh, government of Rwanda Universal Health Coverage Scheme, which is over 85% of the population, which is amazing, was how, how, do we, how do we reach them and let them know there's a new way in which they can now access a server? And, and it, it took a while for us to realize that. And then, and then you suddenly think, actually, this group has already been reached by telcos um, and the cell phone and mobile phone operators. And they, they completely know how to um, message and um, to, you know, to, to get to their entire network. I was recently having conversations um, in my previous role in, in Kenya, Safaricom has 35 million users on its platform for mobile money. So um, I think that what, how we see our work going forward is when we're very clear about our strategy and the areas in which the foundation can um, really add value and add expertise and, and, and importantly, the areas that, that we won't be involved in because there's other actors in the field that, that do it better and, and other global organizations. So we're very focused about um, how, what our role is in terms of primary healthcare and health system strengthening. I think we'll be really clear about um, what the role of the private sector plays and how instrumental they can be, particularly in terms of sustainability and, and accessibility. So, 
Um, I'm really looking forward to engaging in, in some of those discussions and some of those exemplars because, you know, if the same 35 million people are using M-Pesa in, in, um, in Kenya can use that same platform to access certain parts of healthcare using new technology, that would be a great place for us to be and to help develop um, those partnerships. You see, thanks very much. And thanks for raising the issue of the private sector, because, you know, they're often lost in the discussion. Uh, and I think, you know, there are, there are a whole range of assets in the private sector that uh, we can bring to bear uh, on strengthening health systems. So thank you very much for raising that. So we're moving on now to questions from the audience. Uh, Dr. Patrick, one of the questions that might uh, resonate with you, uh, Dr. Don, as well as Tracy, uh, and Robin, given the experience of the uh, fellowship program, is you know how can we leverage technology to have virtual interactions in training specialized health workers across the continent? Uh, you know it, we, we know we're doing it within countries, or some countries are doing it within countries. But what are the opportunities to do it across the continent so we can scale up much more quickly, given the the need to do that with a sense greater sense of urgency? So we'll start with Dr. Patrick and then Dr. Don and then uh, Tracy and, uh, and Robin. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Jorgen. I think we have everything that's required to start. Uh, with this COVID pandemic, we've realized that we have more than we think we have. Uh, and actually uh, some of these classes remotely have started. Uh, and the funny thing is that they have started with the Western world rather than within Africa. So to me, this is very feasible. There's some of the infrastructure challenges and the bandwidth that we need to improve in some instances, but uh, there is no reason why we shouldn't start. Great, thanks, Dr. Patrick. Dr. Don? Well, again, uh, I think if there's one lesson that COVID has taught us is to move away from our traditional way of teaching. <laughs> And so uh, at the University of Liberia, we have moved to like 60% digital, 40% uh, face to face. Uh, the challenges are like the, are the same as Patrick mentioned, infrastructure, internet is the biggest challenge we have at the moment. Great. So let's then turn to the investors, uh, Robin, Dr. Mona and Tracy, and ask them what they think investors can do to bridge the digital gap that we have in Africa. Tracy, can you start with you, please? Yeah, sure, so um, um, a great question. And, you know, and for us in the foundation, the time is now. You know, there's no better time when we've all been forced to do things digitally because of a pandemic um, in terms of training. So we should build on that momentum. Um, for us, I think um, some of the areas we're most interested in is actually bringing partners together. So y y your first question was around scaling across, um, across a continent. When I look at the work and the potential of um, organizations like Smart Africa, like AMREF, and actually working with those organizations that already have a footprint across the continent, then I see and they, and a lot of knowledge of those um, individual um, geographers, then I see there's real potential for us to move forward uh, with focus and with speed. Thanks, Robin. Sure, uh, a couple comments on this. Uh, the first I would share is we're really excited about Project Echo, which is using kind of virtual tools like Zoom to, to support upskilling, uh, sharing of best practices and guidelines around COVID. We've also seen it around HIV um, for health workers across, across the continent and the world. So we think that's a great digital solution for in-service training and support. Um, and we're very eager to invest in the scale up of that and looking for other co-funders on that. I do also want to say we don't we don't want to have too much of a like um, infatuation with technology. Um, it obviously helps. We've all been living in work from home land for the last you know year, um, but it still takes people. So I just really want to emphasize that you can't you know people develop technology, people implement technology. So I don't want to get too obsessed with technology that we forget the people behind it. Um, and just one very quick comment um, on something Mona mentioned about how do we retain the specialists that are being trained. And one thing I wanted to mention that's 
really important about training programs like the African Pediatric Fellowship and others that we're looking to support with government is we're building this capacity on the continent. So in the past, people would fly out of the continent to get their training and life happens. You meet your partner, you get a job offer. It's much harder to come back. But when you're training on the continent, you're more likely to stay. That's why we have a 98% retention rate in African Pediatric Fellowship program and why we wanna build these hubs um, across the continent. It also helps when governments, you know, offer certain kinds of bonds, like governments can agree, you know, you, if you get, you know, if you get, get funded to train to become a midwife, if you agree to serve five years in a, you know, rural health center, then that pays back, you know, what, what the funder like Elma or others covered to, 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 to finance your education. So, so there are tools also to ensure retention. And it's why it's so critical to invest in the capacity of people and institutions on the continent, in addition to obviously technology and digital that helps bring down the training costs. Thanks, Robin. And thanks for reminding us that technology is not going to solve all of our problems. Uh, I think it's a, it's a time, timely uh, refrain. Uh, Dr. Mona? Yeah, very, very few comments from my side. I mean, I, I agree with everything that everybody else said. Um, we, we definitely see the, and I mentioned this in my comments, the importance of a lot of the digitization elements um, from an efficiency perspective, from, from scaling up. Um, but I'm also cognizant of the fact that, you know, the, the, the level of, of connectivity also on the continent um, could be a hurdle sometimes, especially for extreme rural areas. So, so I think it's thinking about digitization but in much more innovative ways is important. So, so I gave the example of the solar energy and sort of, you know, powering people. But there could be a lot of other partnerships between telecos and you know healthcare workers between internet companies. And so I think we need to be thinking from a cross sectoral perspective on forging some of these partnerships and cross disciplines to be able to solve this. Tamara, thank you very much. Um, that concludes the inputs from our panelists. And I must say, I've got two pages of notes for myself. So my learnings from this session are two pages of notes. And I'd like, in, as we close, I would like to thank all of our panelists, as well as our audience, for joining us today in this, what I think was an incredibly rich uh, discussion. Uh, of course, you know, we can talk about health workforce for the rest of the afternoon, evening, and we still wouldn't be exhaustive. And I'd like to also thank the Skull World Forum and the organizers uh, for giving us this platform. Thank you very much. Today, we have heard from our panelists about the importance of building a strong health workforce, from investing in systems that sustain long-term progress, to seeking innovative solutions to address the persistent challenges with workforce shortages and quality. This past year of the pandemic has really shone a spotlight on the weaknesses in our health systems. And might I say, health systems both in low and middle income countries and in higher income countries alike. But as we start to regain control over the pandemic, we cannot return to business as usual. To ensure a successful end to this pandemic and better prepare for the future, we are told frequently now that we can expect future pandemics. And I think that's absolutely true. Uh, we said so after the Ebola epidemic, uh, I'm not sure how many of us learned many lessons. I hope we all learn many, many more lessons because of this current pandemic. But it's clear that we must continue to strengthen our health systems and we must strengthen the health workforce that staff them. The World Health Organization Year of the Health and Care Worker captures this unique moment in our history where people all around the world are calling out for more support for those on the front line of not just this pandemic, but all the maladies we face. Some key themes that I've picked up from this discussion are that there are many opportunities for funders to support discrete and catalytic investments aligned to national strategies that not only make an immediate impact, but can also multiply exponentially over time. I think the Panelists all have all emphasized the importance of long-term commitments. And we've heard from all three government uh, and Dr. Don from the academic uh, space that you, know, you need a 10-year horizon for human resources. We also heard that countries do have HRH plans 
which are well thought through, but there is, an, there is a need for investment, external investment. Governments will put in money, but they need the additional support from our partners. We need innovation, and we've heard about some of the innovations. We've heard about the taking advantage of the impact that COVID has made on both health financing, health systems, and the global solidarity we've seen in many respects with respect to both the HIV epidemic in, especially in Africa, as well as the, the COVID response. And we would like to see this kind of global solidarity for the health workforce, for developing the health workforce. Uh, there are many lessons uh, to be learned from government leaders. And we want to thank those that shared these valuable lessons with us today. I am convinced that working together, we can continue to work together to, to close the gaps in the health workforce and ensure that everyone has access to quality health services delivered by well-trained health professionals at all levels of care, from community through to district hospitals, tertiary care and quaternary care. And I am very comforted that we are starting to focus on specialty and subspecialty care uh, on our continent. And I'd like to thank all of our investors who are supporting our governments in doing that. Uh, and I'd like to suggest that we continue this conversation. Clearly, we cannot close this conversation today. And I'm sure that uh, between the, the Skull Foundation, as well as, as Chai, working with all of our partners, we'll be happy to continue this conversation so that we take some very concrete steps uh, to implement the kind of programs I think we've come up with in some countries and we take them to scale on the continent so that everyone on this continent can benefit. And we close the gaps that we are currently seeing with respect to access to quality healthcare as well as the health workforce. Again, I'd like to thank every one of the panelists very sincerely for your considered inputs. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we really appreciate it and we look forward to continuing the conversation. Thanks very much to the audience. Uh, without you, of course, we wouldn't be progressing. Thanks very much, everyone, and goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye.